Okay, this is March, a very important ma uh, uh, month, and a lot of things are being celebrated and awareness uh, being created in this month. We know that we have uh, National Reading Month is for March, Disability Awareness Month, Multiple Sclerosis Awareness Month, Kidney Month, among so many other things. But we are focusing today on uh, uh, history, Women's History Month. That is what we're focusing now. And remember that on Friday, we are going to be celebrating the women. It's a National Women's Day on Friday. Even though in Nigeria, Women's Day is like five or six or seven. <laughs> Every time is Women's Day. Even including Men's Day is Women's Day partially. Okay, well, today we're talking about investing in women and looking ahead to International Women's Day, which, like I said, is coming up on Friday. And joining us to discuss this are uh, um, Muta Ngozi, who is change leader with Nguvu Collective, and also Itoro Usoro, change leader Nguvu Collective. Good morning, lady and gentleman, and welcome to the program. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Mm. Good morning. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Let's begin with ladies. Ladies first, because this is what we're talking about. International Women's Day is coming up on Friday. Let's get a little bit of overview of what is going to be happening or what the significance of this day is. Good morning again. Thank you for having me once again on your show. Mm. So International Women's Day is uh, a yearly event. Like you said, we are celebrated like billions of times, yeah. if I may put that <laughs> word, in a year. So that means that the importance of women cannot be overemphasized, especially when it comes to, um, in every aspect, there's no aspect that women don't play a major role. Right, from birthing to work to home front to education to every aspect, there's no way you don't find women right now. So, what we're just saying is okay, let's find a way to make it better to marginalize it in equality, not in the sense of feminism, but in the sense of let everybody have a balanced um, opportunity. So, this, this year's um, type. Um, so title for International Women's in 2024 says Invest in Women Accelerate Progress. So investing in women, we're talking of girl child, starting from the girl child is the like the basis of investing in women up to in every other area, um, especially when it comes to let me align it to why I'm on the show, lawmaking and change making changes. So mm. creating changes in, in the aspect of making sure that women's voices are heard. Women voices are heard and and they are being fixed in positions where they can actually make changes. And this is a very important um, role that women play in the world at large. So where making changes is better than yesterday, and we hope that it gets better with time. Yeah. Well, feminism is not a bad thing. It's just that some people are just misunderstanding it or misinterpreting it or acting negatively. Feminism is actually let the woman be seen and heard women. and let them also participate. Let them be given the equal opportunities, just like you said. So it's the negative part of it that I don't know where it came from. That was not the initial definition of feminism, you know. But um, let me go to Itoro right now. Uh, what does this mean to you as a person? I'm not asking you because of your organization or anything, but when you talk about celebrating women, what does it mean to you as a man? Okay, thank you once again for having me. Okay. Um, celebrating women is, uh, is what we should you know, do often, just like it has been happening. And, you know, if you look at the family structure, you see... Uh, the role that women have to play, and you see it's important they're celebrated because uh, most often uh, these women do a whole lot of sacrifices. Uh, they get to, you know, put uh, so much uh, just to ensure the family is happy, the man is happy, and sometimes they do forget, you know, to take care of uh, themselves. So celebrating them too is a way of, you know, putting them out there and making them feel good, feel better, and of course, uh, become uh, at the best. Okay. Thank you very much. 
Now, let, let me go back to you, Ngozi. Um, you're talking about laws, policies, and all those things that will make the lives of women better. Let's, let's get to see what the deficiencies are, especially in the Nigerian society, that you can identify and say these are the things that are missing, that if they are put in place, then the life of the woman in Nigeria will be better. Some of these things that need to be addressed. I can't um, see. I okay. think I lost you. Okay. Is the question for me or for you? Okay, let me, let me uh, ask the question again. You, you're, you're, you're coming in uh, from the angle of policy, from laws and all those things. And I'm just saying in simple yes. terms, what do you think uh, are some of the things that are missing, whether policy-wise or otherwise, um, in Nigeria, in the Nigerian society, that you think if they are put in place, the life of the woman in Nigeria will be better. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I will still go back to the reason I'm also on the show, which is um, uh, I'm a change maker coming on this platform on the from the platform of Nguvu Collective. Nguvu Collective is a change platform, formerly change.org, where uh, we use the platform that is used to make petitions and ensure that Changes are made and voices are heard. And people go there to sign this petition. Signing this petition is just saying, okay, I am with you on this one. Let's see what change that we ca can be made. So I'm here specifically because this year's um, team says invest in women and accelerate progress. And I'm coming on the platform or on behalf of single mothers. Single mothers in the terms of married, separated, married, divorced, not married, but have a child raped, um, domestic violence survivors, whatever context they, they come in as a single mom. So you find out in Nigeria that a lot of men abandon these responsibilities of child care or child support to the women um, for whatever reason, right? And this reason cannot even include or is solely excluded from, oh, I don't have money because nobody has money. Um, so even the women that the women that do it wake up every day and show up for these kids do not have money stashed somewhere. They do it because the responsibility and the responsibility is not something you choose to do. It's something you have to do. So my reason for being here and this year's theme, I am hoping that investing in women in this instance would be able to have an opportunity and a platform of um push this campaign up to meeting i think yesterday i had a meeting with um, one of the lawmakers in lagos state um on Biodo Rekoya. he gave us audience yesterday and he promised to pull this petition to see that these situations where women are abandoning the responsibility there are laws i mean i'm not saying there are no laws but the laws are enforcement is a problem and actually even getting these men to do anything without going to court is also a problem so he criticized it, and I'm hoping that I'll go back and um, re rephrase it and reform it to, a, to something more structured. So let me lessening the burden of these responsibilities on this on the women would really help them to even be better. Because I personally, I would have to share a lot of my dream of what I would want to do because I am burdened with the responsibility of day-to-day -day care of my children. I would not want to give my best to the to the society. Maybe I want to be a, a, a doctor. Maybe I want to be work with United Nations. Maybe I want to be a volunteer somewhere. We all have dreams as women. But as a single mom, it's almost impossible to align your dream, take care of the body that's supposed to be shared by two partners, take care of these children mentally, your own mental health, their own mental health, and still have an opportunity to build your dream and even give back to the society. Because we all have our inborn talents and, and things we want to do, where we want to try. But we cannot because you are suppressed with excess and overburdened responsibility. So if, if, if a law or if the government can even, if, even if it's not actually creating a law we're still working on that but even if the government can create an avenue where there'll be some sort of support for women you know but single mothers are stigmatized in nigeria already so if there will be like an acceptance and in the meantime pending when you can even get your spouse to do these things because these are daily needs 
then there will be there will be some sort of a support where you can go and get support for the children because the children suffer some drop out of school some don't even have the basic daily needs that they need and then they're susceptible to to men or women out there that are child pedophiles that are looking for how to entice these children with things that ordinarily their mom cannot provide on their own so it's a menace and I, i'm hoping that this investing in women and in girl child or in children as a whole would help lessen the burden and help us women that are single moms to be able to thrive to also contribute our quota to the society. Thank you. Okay, yeah, well, well put. Um, Itoro, for you, what does it mean to invest in women? Okay, so um, thank you. I also like to talk uh, based on uh, my campaign. Um, we are pushing for uh, HPV vaccines, for cervical cancer, which is actually a preventable you know, disease uh, to actually be uh, brought to the barest minimum in our nation. We've seen that this is the second most uh, common cancer in women, and uh, so many women are ignorant of this. Uh, from my work in the past few years, uh, we've seen that women of all walks of life, you know, you can see some people in some, you know, top offices uh, thinking they know about this, but you're shocked when you meet when you're meeting with them and some have not heard about this and some have, also, have heard about it but do not take that important. So for me, I think investing in women uh, is prioritizing health care uh, because without their health, they cannot do anything. And the first step to do this is uh, through you know, awareness creation, especially when it has to do with silent uh, killer disease like cervical cancer, which is actually you know, ravaging our society today. So if um, government uh, gets to invest, you know, in the awareness, gets to invest in the infrastructure when it comes to health, and uh, ensuring that the vaccine, thank God, in October 2023, um, the HPV vaccine was actually rolled out uh, in Nigeria, the pilot phase in, in 16 states, and, and in May 2024, uh, the remaining states too will also be doing the uh, same. But then it shouldn't just stop there. Uh, because just rolling out the vaccine and getting uh, the few persons, I think 7.7 .7 million girls is the target in Nigeria, shouldn't just stop there, but they should go past that to creating platforms where women can also get screened. Uh, there is a follow-up mechanism to ensure that people who are positive, you know, get uh, treatment because cervical cancer, like I said, is preventable. It's a preventable uh, cancer. But then we're having countless women die from this. So I feel, uh, for me, governments should prioritize health. Uh, they should ensure that uh, women do not need to die, you know, from such, uh, you know, infections, from such diseases that can actually be preventable. Why die from something that you can prevent? So if government do well, uh, investing uh, money, investing resources, and ensuring that uh, we, these women have access, you know, to these facilities. And at some point where they need to pay, it's affor affordable. But then I think this will go a long way, you know, to help accelerate the, pro the progress we're looking at. Because at the end of the day, you see that women are pivotal, not just in their families. You check up uh, communities and uh, eventually at the world at large. So for me, this should be uh, a good way to invest in women. Uh, let me remain with you. Before that uh, vaccine was rolled out, you were uh, at the fore of creating this awareness and it has been rolled out and all that. I'd like to know the experience so far uh, in that exercise. Uh, what has been the challenge or what have been the challenges uh, while you're trying to get the people to know about it, to receive this vaccine and whatever it is, from the perspective of the people and from the government. I know you've mentioned some of the things that need to be put in place, but for purpose of emphasis, let's get to know your experience uh, on the field uh, that made you mention what you have mentioned, for instance. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, uh, misconception has really been a major challenge. You know, uh, you get to see people talk about a whole lot of stuff. You get to some areas, their culture, some, some you know, leaders in the areas, they are saying all manner about the vaccine. 
you know, people, uh, you get to hear people say, if you take the vaccine, uh, you will not be fatal, you cannot put to bed. Some say you're going to die and a whole lot of stuff. So that has really been a major, uh, you know, a concern. In short, uh, our last experience, the one that really shocked me was when we got to a university and I was expecting to, you know, you know have, you know, um, this rapport with them and of course i was not expecting to see them you know uh, uh refrain themselves from what we we're talking about and we we're talking to the science faculty like i can i can say we made over 500 students and less than 10 five percent of that number knew about that and they were even you know pushing it away meaning that in that particular area the misconception is so high so I think a government should do more by creating awareness, let people know this. Unlike a COVID-19 uh, vaccine, you know, that is recent, like in 2019 and 2020, uh, the vaccine came out. Uh, uh, so the HPV vaccine has been there. So it's not, it's not something new that we, we are just trying, trying out. Just that uh, uh, the federal government of Nigeria rolled out uh, the vaccine last year, but it's been there for years. Uh, other countries have been using it and it's working. So um, federal government should put measures to ensure that, you know, some of these misconceptions are actually dealt with because it's really taking a hold on the target uh, population. Uh, you go to schools like like the, the the mobilization strategy of federal government is you know going to secondary school since uh, the age range is nine to fourteen. So imagine you know going to secondary school and a parent has already you know talked to the children. You don't have to get this. You don't have to receive this. You see, so going there, you are already you know you you are meeting uh, you are hitting the rocks because these children will actually not accept that. So I think uh, federal government should do more in terms of awareness creation, should do more in terms of reaching out to communities, PTAs, talking more with the parents and ensuring that they understand what is happening and also to let them know that it's safe. Because you go out there, people are saying, no, they can't take that, they don't want to die, they don't want to be barren and stuff like that. So this has really been uh, the major uh, challenge, the misconceptions and the myths uh, surrounding the uh, vaccine. But but so far, I I would also want to commend the federal government for the great job they are doing because uh, I think it, it's a great first step and uh, we trust that they are able to pull through at the end of the day. Okay. Um, Ngozi, it's, it's your time now. Um, you, you said you are zeroing in on uh, um, single motherhood, gender-based violence, and so many other things that are related to that, maybe that even make women become um, single uh, mothers. You had a rapport with a lawmaker. would like to have a peek into what that discussion was and the challenges that, from the part of government, that uh, you were told were militating against implementation of these laws, because you said there are laws that should take care of that, but the implementation is a problem. So what are some of these problems? Because when you're talking to the lawmakers, we are the people, we need to be talking also to them. We have to have insight into what their challenges are and what the challenges of the women who are the victims are as well. Okay, so thank you very much. So um, apart from the lawmaker that we had a meeting with, I also have reached out to the um, commissioner for women uh, poverty elevation, um, Honorable Cecilia Dada. So I was at her office last week as well. So I dropped a letter which has been approved. So I'm waiting to get a meeting with her. So I've been communicated that a meeting date will be given to me very soon. I had to go through her as well because she's a commissioner for women affairs. So I'm hoping that she coming on the platform and pushing this as well to the lawmakers directly, it will also go a long way. And she has approved that the, the, the office has confirmed that to me when they reached out to me. So the meeting we also had with the honorable and other lawmakers was quite um, very, very intense because he has sat down as a lawmaker, he looked at it from all the angles. So one of the issues that was pointed out to me, which I also knew was that because in my petition and my campaign, I'm asking that this money be deducted from source, right? These men work, like, right? Some have a nice job. Even the women know where these men work. 
I mean, their HR is there. But even when you go to court, it's as if you as a woman, the onus to prove that the man can provide is on you. You have to say this is where he was. They will not be asking, oh, does he earn much? How much is he earning? How much is the woman earning? She didn't keep money somewhere, but she shows up. She does these things. So there's nothing. So it's very uncomfortable and unfair on the woman that she has to prove that someone somewhere is, is buoyant enough to take his reservation. This is not an option. It's not a choice. It's something you have to do whether you like it or not. So I was asking that these monies be deducted, deducted from source. I mean, we have BBU and we have NIN. It can be deducted. Why do we have those things if it can't be linked to the person? But he sat down and said, okay, we're not in USA. We're not in United Kingdom, where you have your social security number. Once you put it in, all the jobs you had from where you left, from all your life history just shows up on the system. He said that we're not there yet. Right, if the man says he has resigned from his job, you may not be able to just stand up and say, Oh, they declare bankruptcy simply because they want to evade responsibility. They say they don't have anything. So even go as far as once the matter is in court, they go to sell off all the properties that probably the woman knows about and take the money somewhere. They have a bank account that they operate together and she knows. He closes it down and moves his money somewhere else. So you find out that the woman needs to be tracing and trailing the man to know how she can prove that he can actually provide. It's not supposed to be that way. You're a father, I'm a mother. Both of us brought these children into the world. The woman is not even saying, do it all. He's saying, take your share of the responsibility. So these are the problems that he pointed out that how do you trace and be able to deduct from source? Because you may not be able to quickly do all these things because there are really no record purposes. I mean, this is 2024. Even in the court, me as a lawyer, he's still a struggle bringing tech into the legal system. Some some judges may not be comfortable with some kind of evidence that you bring in, like now they are accepting, but it's a very slow process. So these are the challenges. So we are looking at it. So we are looking at the practicability, right? So the practical, those are the things. So he says, okay, I want to look at the and then also, I brought out the issue of the um, violence against persons uh, um, law, which is only in FCT. We don't have that in Lagos State. And Lagos is a state pay sector, and it's very, very happy to be part of the people that will bring that into Lagos. Because in that very act, which is only in FCT, you have all these things spelled out. If you do not take care of your child, you are going to jail for three years. If you do not do this, you are, you are paying a one million naira fine. Those things are spelled out. Men that beat their wife, men that stop their wife from working, men that seclude their wife from their family members, all those things are clearly stated. And he's like, okay, I don't mind trying to see if we can bring that one, if it will help, amongst other things. So it's still a work in progress. I think we'll have a meeting again, and I'm hoping that we'll get victory from there. So those are the few things. And, and, and then you also made suggestions on other things that can bring on board. Okay, uh, well, as, let me stay with you. While we're at it, um, what would you say to the women themselves? Because it's not, uh, it's not always the best to just talk about one side. What would you tell the women on this International Women's Day? Because some of these women actually have baby fathers, as we, we, we call them now. Uh, some of them have uh, husbands that they have divorced and all that. And they refuse even partial custody uh, for these men over their children and then they are asking for for support and all that it's it's in it's rare in cases where you have shared custody maybe three times in a week or during holidays or the man takes responsibility the woman takes responsibility and all that and you still find a father who does not do anything so some fathers complain that the women exclusively have rights to these children and they don't give them the rights to to their children and they still ask for support and it's a problem to them. So what would you say to the women, uh, you know, uh, while you're expecting the man to share the responsibility, what about also custody of the children? So you see this topic you raised now, it's, it's, it's very, we've been start talking about it, we're going to take the whole day, but I'll just, I'm going to summarize it. So first of all, let me start with the issue of custody. So it depends on the age of the child, right? Mm -hmm. Normally, as a natural process, a mother has custody, um, a has the custody of what of a child of a particular age. There's no way you can take a child that's less than five years or seven years and go and give it to a man, right? Because it's it's assumed and that this woman, the woman and a mother, will nurture her child better. So that is ruled out. 
in some circumstances, I've seen where custody is actually given to the man because the court feels the man might do better. Some women actually abandon their children for the man. And when they go to court, there's no way the court will take that child from the man that's been taking care of this child back to the mother. It will not be done because the child's welfare will always be considered. Coming to the issue of shared custody, so a lot of men walk out from the marriages or because they have issues from there. I'm not generalizing, but I'm speaking from a higher percentage, right? Yeah. So a lot of men just walk away from their marriages and, oh, I'm upset with this woman. Oh, for whatever reason, the only way I could hurt this woman is, let, her, let me see how she's going to do it by herself. Oh, I've been providing. So men actually were providing in the marriage. But when the marriage is over, they turn around and abandon the, the, the mothers. Mm -hmm. And then you see that, oh, these children are already with the mom. And the man throws in some three years, five years later and says, oh, I don't have access to my child. Maybe by then they're in court. So tell me how they are going to now. There is, it's almost impossible for you to now come and have access. But you can have shared custody if you will now sit back and take your responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's not like it's a case of if you don't take your responsibilities, you will not have access. But even when some women offer access, even myself, I am speaking from experience, offer access to the man, it will still not be taken. Still because, I don't know, I, I think it's the society enabling the men that no matter how long you go, these children will always come looking for you. But, I mean, this, the children are not the children of this is, 20, this is the 21st century. So I think that mindset of, oh, they will come and look for me needs to change. You need to invest time in your child. And, and then the women as well, that their fathers of their children or husbands or partners are doing their bits. I don't think there's any woman. I'm not, I don't know, maybe. But if you're a woman and you're listening to me and you're denying the, the father of your child assets for whatever reason, it is wrong. Because both parents are needed in the child's life. If the both parents are willing to be in the child's life, that willingness is number one. Are you willing? If you're willing, without without subjecting the child or using it as an opportunity to torture one party. Maybe the child is being tortured. Maybe the, the mother is being manipulated just because of, I don't know. Let's leave our issues aside and focus on the children. Mm. And I think to a very large extent, a reasonable woman will be willing to do that if the man will be willing also to put his ego aside and do what he's supposed to do. Mm. Okay. That's my own opinion. Yeah, it's a it's a but very salient one because whatever very, issues the parents on, have, it depends on the parties. Really, it's mm. not a, a a straightforward explanation. Yeah, whatever the pro issues are between the parents, the children must not suffer. No. Yes. Okay. That that's yes. a very good one. Itoro, let me let me come to you. Uh, what are you looking forward to? You know, uh, a future. Uh, for the Nigerian woman, even beyond just uh, t talking about their health, what kind of future do you hope to see the Nigerian woman have? Okay, I'm hoping to see uh, the Nigerian woman happy, hoping to see her living at her base, hoping, hoping to see her, you know, educated, hoping to see her um, well cared for and informed, not misinformed, not marginalized and you know, given the opportunity, you know, both in jobs and every, in political leadership and every other aspect where, you know, they are comfortable, their voices are heard and I mean because by the time you look down and see the input uh, that women make in our society, personally I've, 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 I've done a couple of things, I've been in the business world. Uh, I've seen that most of them are drivers of uh, all, uh, most of the small and medium scale enterprises and you see their dedication, you see their passion, their consistency. So at the end of the day, if women are invested in, you see, uh, it, it, it's a step forward, not just for them, uh, but for the communities and the nation at large. So I'm looking forward to uh, seeing women happy, seeing them living at their best, seeing them you know, excited about life and, of course, giving their best. Okay. Just a final word from you, Ngozi, uh, to everybody. Okay. So to everyone, first of all, to all my beautiful sisters out there, I'm wishing you happy International Women's Day. Keep shining. Keep doing what you do. Um, keep maximizing opportunities, keep making yourself um, your best version of yourself. For my 
for the single mothers out there, you're doing very well. Um, it's not easy. The society is not making it easy. Uh, the stigma is overwhelming. Um, you're being, if you had lost your spouse or the person died, people come to mourn with still sympathize, probably as, as self responsibility for one or two child children. But as a single mother, you're being judged, you're being avoided, you're being, there's a whole lot a single mother deals with, right? So just keep finding a balance, try to find somewhere in between to to still achieve that dream that you would have ordinarily have achieved. Because no woman sets out to go into a marriage to walk out of it, but it happens, life happens. Yeah, we, we cry, we regret, but let's that not bring us down. Try your best to find a balance. Try your best to keep thriving. Let this celebration, as, as if nobody celebrates you on International Women's Day, celebrate yourself. You are doing amazing. You are doing amazing. Look back where you're coming from, and you see that yesterday was better than um, today is better than yesterday, and tomorrow will definitely be better than today. So um, let's be happy, and uh, everything that we wish to achieve, let's try, no matter how difficult it is, let's get that dream. There's this feeling feeling that I get when something I've been struggling to do gets done no matter how long it takes if it tallies keep pushing and it will only get better okay thank you even the proudest of us the most stubborn of us know that the women rule the world we are just proud we were born proud <laughs> we do things like proud people but we know that the women rule the world so we'll just take this opportunity to say happy international women's day or should i say days because there are many just, not just on Friday. Yes. but uh, uh we wish you well and we hope that things will turn out better for the women folk and for everybody Thank you for coming thank on the program you. today. Thank you for having us. Yes. Okay, Itoro as well. Thank you for being a wonderful contributor to this program this morning. Thank you for having us. Okay. All right, we've been talking to Muta Ngozi, change leader with Nguvu Collective, and also Itoro Usoro, uh, change leader as well with Nguvu Collective. We'll be, we've been talking about investing in women and looking ahead to the International Women's Day. It's on Friday, and we're using this time to, in advance, say Happy Women's Day to all the women, and mothers especially. My name is Nyamgul Agadji. This is where we wrap it up this morning. Let's do it again tomorrow. Bye for now.